Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I'm Dr. Jeff Turk. I'm a member of the chemistry department here at Alma College. Uh, and today, a part of our uh, uh, the Your Health Speaker Series is here at our college. We're excited to have everybody. And this is a unique educational uh, opportunity. It is a collaboration between Alma College, SVSU, My Michigan Health, and um, MSU's College of uh, Human Medicine. And this uh, goal is to bring together researchers and physicians alike who can talk to us about current topics that are of interest uh, to the audience. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, before we have our, we had our lecture, we have our lecture today, our keynote speaker met with Alma College students. And we also had a round table discussion with uh, lots of third year MSU medical students, which was wonderful. I thank everybody here for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Mark Breeby, and he is the Director of Community and Government Relations with MSU's College of Human Medicine. And he's gonna get us kicked off today and introduce our speaker, Mark. Hey, right. Thank you, Dr. Turk. And uh, just wanna thank you all who are here in the room live and those uh, joining us um, virtually. Um, as uh, Dr. Turk mentioned, my name is Mark Breeby. I'm Director of Community and Government Relations at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. MSU College of Human Medicine and Alma College have been collaborating on the Your Health Lecture Series for more than 10 years. Uh, and it's an extension of the Early Assurance Program Agreement between our two schools. I wanna thank Dr. Turk and Alma College for the continuing partnership. I would like to note that at the conclusion of Dr. Sashdev's uh, presentation. He will answer questions from the audience uh, written into the Q&A feature uh, for those joining via Zoom and for those uh, in the room. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Ahmet Sashdev is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology and Ophthalmology and director of the Division of Neuromuscular Medicine at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. He grew up in Macomb Township and has been a Michigan resident most of his life. Dr. Sashdev received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Michigan. I believe he also did his master's at Wayne State University and then finished up uh, with his MD from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. So it's always nice to have an alum uh, do one of these lectures for us. Along the way, he developed a passion for the nerves that live outside the brain and for the things that those nerves connect to. Dr. Sashdev has also developed a passion for developing new knowledge. With that, Dr. Sashdev. All right, thank, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Uh, and thank you all for joining this evening. Um, I, I do want to invite uh, discussion and conversation. Um, I, I've tried to gear our talk tonight towards our undergraduate audience. Uh, and so we've divided the talk into chapters to talk about specific topics. Uh, along the way, if there are questions about the topics we're talking about, please, by all means, um, chime in. Let's discuss. Uh, and so, uh, again, I'm Amit Sachdev, and we're going to be uh, talking about suppressing the immune system in a pandemic and how that can really put our patients and our clinicians between what we perceive to be a rock and a hard place. And, and hopefully I'll demonstrate what that means. There we go. Um, before we begin, of course, I do have some disclosures. Uh, I do run a very robust clinical trial operation, uh, and those clinical trials involve pharmaceutical clinical trials and pharmaceutical partners. The co contracts for those clinical trials are between Michigan State University and the pharmaceutical partner, but my career benefits by administering those contracts and by recruiting to those clinical trials, and so they pop up here on my disclosure list. Uh, there are quite a few companies that have interest in the neuromuscular space, uh, and I do, in addition to running trials for those companies, often uh, serve on advisory boards, helping them make scientific decisions uh, uh, about uh, the direction to take their work. 
Uh, and then I finally like to point out that the US Department of Education holds significant sway over what I say by virtue of the massive amount of student loan debt that they hold. <laughs> so go Department of Education. <laughs> Uh, additional disclosures, when I joined MSU, I had more hair, and that is a picture of me, uh, and that I cannot function without a team. Uh, and so herein are the many members of that team who help us care for patients with neuromuscular illnesses uh, at the East Lansing campus. Uh, and uh, those patients travel from 72 of the counties in the state of Michigan, the last time we looked. Um, so we really have a very broad impact as you can imagine, interest in rare disease is um, rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and we really try to give these patients a home. Uh, every therapy that we discuss today is going to be off label. We will try our very best to use generic names. Occasionally, a trade name might slip out. Apologies for that. Um, but these are off label uses. Uh, and so, if you are a patient out there and thinking about a drug that might be useful for your disease or condition, you're gonna to wanna to talk to a physician. Okay, so here are our chapters. So chapter one is gonna be just the immune system basics. Then we're gonna talk about autoimmune diseases. So that's when the immune system turns on self. We're gonna to move to how we might damage the immune system to stop that disease process. And then we're gonna to pivot towards the topic of the day, which is COVID-19. and how it elicits immune responses. And then we're gonna try to figure out what a patient should do who has autoimmune illness, that means their body is attacking them, and a need for a robust immune system, that means they have to defend themselves. Uh, and how are we gonna try to um, uh, balance those risks? So first, our, our first chapter, which is the immune system. Um, many of you may be aware that the immune system has two major comp uh, components or sections to it. We have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And we're gonna learn about these two branches briefly. So the innate immune system are the things that are not very specific that keep us healthy, right? So the skin, the skin keeps many bad things out. And when the skin is broken, there is a risk of infection to the underlying tissues which is why we care for those wounds until they heal. Uh, and so the skin, the good bacteria in our gut, these are not specific to any one threat. They are generally a part of how we defend ourselves. Another part of how we defend ourselves is a, a subsystem called the complement cascade. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. When you cut your finger or your skin, after a day, there is a wheel, there's a raised area of inflammation. It might be red, it might ooze, but it's not infected. There is some inflammation that builds up in that location. Similarly, when you undergo surgery and the, the tissues are cut, inflammation and granulation tissue forms in those areas. This inflammation that's local to an area that's been damaged, that's the complement cascade. It's not specific but it creates an environment that is bad for bacteria. And so if bacteria cannot thrive, then they cannot set in an infection and threaten the host. So the adaptive immune system we'll talk about in a little bit. Let's continue to focus on the innate immune system and let's talk about this complement cascade. There are three different ways that you can trigger this generic inflammation. And I'm gonna use my little pointer here to indicate classical, lectin, and alternative. Uh, and what I'd like you to pay attention to here in the classic pathway is these antibody complexes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what antibodies are, what we're foreshadowing a little bit here. An antibody, when it complexes with something, when it attaches to something, will promote inflammation in its vicinity. And so as you can imagine, that's really useful if you've targeted a bacteria and it might be injurious if you've targeted a tissue like the skin and eczema or the hair follicle and alopecia 
or the muscle nerve junction in myasthenia gravis. So the, com the complement cascade is triggered by one of these three pathways and the complement cascade results in phagocytosis, that's things being eaten, inflammation and destruction, lysis. So that end result of triggering, triggering the complement cascade is that locally the uh, environment nearby is not very conducive to bacteria, but exposed long enough is not very conducive to healthy tissues either. Whatever you've triggered this cascade by will get damaged in one of these three are triggers and ultimately one of these three outcomes, inflammation, cell lysis, and phagocytosis. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but there's the major reason I'm emphasizing the complement cascade is it's because it's a part of our adaptive immune system that we have to pay attention to. The part of the immune system that gets all the press is the, uh, I'm sorry, the complement cascade is innate. The part of the immune system that gets all the press is the adaptive immune system. So this is the immune system that's really specific for a particular threat. It is the immune system component that we train with vaccinations or that we rely on to keep us from getting ill in a recurrent fashion, right? So once you get this season's flu, you shouldn't get it again. If you get immunized against tetanus, you're less likely to get it when you're exposed on a fish hook, right? And so these, this is the part of the immune system that is very specific for a specific threat. And it's divided into antibody and cellular directed. Okay. So uh, as my dad would say, holy moly, that is a complicated picture. <laughs> we're not paying attention to the whole picture. The, what we're paying attention to is that antibody mediated means a part of the cell uh, of the defense system, in this case, the B cells, are provoked to mature through several stages until they make antibodies. Antibodies are very specific flags. A flag marks something for attention from the immune system. A lot like the flag on your mailbox marks your mailbox from attention from the postal delivery person. So antibodies are flags. And as we've learned from the complement cascade, the antibody will create local inflammation as one of its outcomes. Cellular directed responses. Again, holy moly. Again, we're not going to pay attention to everything on this slide. The key here is there's another lineage of cells. They're called T cells. So we have B cells for antibodies, and we have T cells these T cells do lots of different things, but roughly what they do is regulate, help, or attack. They govern the function of the immune system. They are the on-off switches. So if you want to, in a very specific way, target something, you should have your T cells on board to on-off switch the immune system, and you should have your B cells on board to create very specific flags. And then once those flags bind, they will very likely trigger the not so specific inflammatory cascade. Okay, so in summary, the immune system uses innate and adaptive responses. And sometimes it attacks otherwise, oh, I haven't gotten, so that, that's the big point, right? An innate and adaptive immune responses, right? So before we go any further, thoughts, questions, concerns, anyone wanna say um, they don't think the immune system exists? Denial? Okay, all right, so we don't have any deniers. All right, thank goodness. That's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> right. Very different conversation. <laughs> okay. So sometimes 
the immune system goes awry. So it's really, really good at targeting foreign objects. The most common foreign objects are bacteria, viruses, funguses, transplanted organs, and implantable devices, right? Uh, and so these sorts of objects get rejected and very quickly get eliminated, unless you have done something to avoid elimination. So when the immune system turns on the body, that same ferocity of, uh, of attack gets turned against body tissues. Some tissues are resilient or recover well, some tissues are not. And as you can imagine, a neurologist is talking about tissues that tend to be fragile. Okay, so how common is it that people have this kind of issue where the body has attacked itself? Um, and so about 3% of the US population, uh, so this is the part of the table we're focusing on. So in the United States, roughly 10 million people. Uh, now that is not 115 million people like we have with obesity. Uh, but it is almost as many people as we have with cancer diagnosis. Uh, it is a major medical issue with substantial morbidity, that is loss of productive time, mortality, death, and cost. Certain organs are very commonly injured. Here the top two are thyroid. This is number of cases per 100,000. And some organs are not very commonly injured. Uh, and so I want you to see myositis where you can hardly see the bar. That's where I live. <laughs> and less common diseases are less studied. Um, so PubMed is our major um, uh, source for medical journal citations. Um, and you can see here, the number of citations in PubMed by uh, search term. I just happened to um, do this the other day uh, to create this table. Um, and again, you can see here at the end, this is where I live. Myositis is muscle inflammation. CIDP is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, that is nerve disorders. And small fiber neuropathy is again, nerve disorders. So while autoimmune diseases are relatively common, some organs are less commonly damaged and those that are less commonly damaged, we just know a lot less about. And unfortunately, those diseases that we know a lot less about tend to be pretty significant in terms of their implications. This is the, uh, neuro, this is the cause of the death amongst patients with autoimmune myasthenia gravis, uh, broken into stated gender over years, uh, relative to the control population for this study. Uh, and you can see really stunning differences between the control population in the solid line and the patient population in the dashed line or the dots. Um, in the years, if you can imagine, from the day that you would diagnose a, a patient who identifies as male with myasthenia gravis, in this population, 40% of those patients would have died by eight, by eight years out. A stunning, stunning number, 40%. Hence the name gravis in the second word of the disease. Um, whereas in the general population, uh, perhaps 18%. Um, disease of relatively of the elder. Uh, and so uh, not surprising that the general population would have had some passage rate too. Uh, unfortunately, this is emblematic of most of the diseases that I confront in my particular practice. Now, uh, as a real challenge, the major predictor of death amongst these patients appears to be infection. That is that they are passing away because their immune system didn't do a good enough job defending them. One can imagine why their immune system did not do a good enough job defending them. 
most of the time it is because their immune system was attacking them and out of the risk of death from that disease process, we decided to suppress it. And herein lies the challenge of the talk. Um, so uh, what you're looking at here is patients who came into the ICU. So this is all patients who had autoimmune illnesses and why they passed away and what was present in their hospitalization that predicted that they would pass away. So low levels of circulating C3, C3 is very high in that complement cascade. When you activate that cascade, it gets consumed. So they had a lot of inflammation present. They were sick, very sick with organ failure when they hit the ICU. And we attempted to use uh, anti-infective agents that simply stalled bacteria rather than killed them. And in these sorts of scenarios, stalling is not good enough. Uh, so cytostatic agents were inappropriate. So in summary, autoimmune diseases are common. Targeting the neuromuscular system is rare. Neuromuscular system damage risks death. The rate of mortality is unfortunately high. And unfortunately, infection is a major predictor of, auto of mortality. Okay, before we go on to our next chapter, any thoughts, questions? Very good. Okay, so how, how do we damage the immune system? Because this seems to be an important topic, right? What are the different approaches that we could take? And this is an evolving area, very, very rapidly evolving area uh, of clinical trials that we are offering. So to keep the immune system from attacking self, the immune system needs to either be modulated or suppressed. These are two important terms that I'm gonna ask you to hold on to, modulated or suppressed. Okay, so what does modulation mean? Well, as you could probably guess, you wanna reduce the intensity of the immune system's activity but you want to keep the structures of the immune system intact. So uh, keep the factory upright, cut the power. Something like that, right? Or uh, give them only half the power they need, right? So um, in that case, the factory can only produce so much because you've managed to hijack it. The hope is you could reverse that hijacking in a time of need. So again, we're gonna think about the antibody. So the antibody, as we talked about, catalytic activity is that complement cascade, right? But the antibody does so much more in its environment. It can result in microbes directly being lysed. It can enchain microbes so that they clump together. As you can imagine, it's easier to address an infection if it's all in one spot. Uh, it can control whether or not microbes got across membranes, either helping promote or restrict the placement of those microbes, keeping bad things out, for example, in the gut versus um, keeping good things in. So antibodies are an important part of our adaptive immune system. Controlling them is one task, one way that we can modulate the immune system, that is reduce the intensity of the immune system without necessarily damaging it. So again, I'm gonna use myasthenia gravis, this disease where the body attacks the place where nerves talk to muscles. So what you have here up in the corner is the T cells, those T cells, regulate, help, or kill. And in this case, the T cells are pushing B cell function. The B cells are producing antibodies. And this is one approach that we use to modulate the immune system. We pull the patient's antibodies out and we give the patient somebody else's antibodies. So intravenous immunoglobulin. 
one approach for modulating the immune system. And so as you can imagine, if the antibodies that were being produced to damage the immune system are now being pulled out of the patient, you can arrest the disease. Another approach is deplete the antibodies. So this is the same diagram. This is a process called plasma exchange. You pull the antibodies out. You just put the blood back in after you filtered it. So in this case, you are, cannot drive disease because you don't have the object that uh, directly flags the tissue in question. What you've not done though, is you've not replaced the antibodies you took. So if you've trained the immune system to do certain things like defend against COVID or the flu or pneumonia, those defenses are now gone. The infrastructure is still there, the B cells to produce the antibodies to defend against those infections, but you've taken the antibodies away. And so if this modulating technique seems to have certain unwanted downstream effects, like you no longer defended against things you thought you would be defended against, it's because it does have those effects. And it's starting to look like maybe modulating, which is just turning down the intensity of the immune response, isn't necessarily the golden ticket, right? Because it itself can have certain implications for whether or not that response is still readily available. Immune suppression reduces the intensity of the immune system, but it does so by damaging the components, right? So um, if we are to lock the doors on that factory, nothing's coming out, nothing's going in. So here's the T cells again. They promote B cell function. That promotes antibody production. And we can introduce certain medications to eliminate those B cells. Again, we've trained B cells for certain purposes, right? Immunizations train B cells to produce antibodies against things we don't want to have to deal with. If we wipe out the B cell populations, we have to retrain the immune system when those populations regrow. But if you wipe out the plasma cells, you wipe out the antibodies. Another approach is damage the T cells, right? So T cell promotes B cell, B cell promotes antibodies, knock out the T cell, and you stop the rest of the line. And here too, we have several agents, both FDA approved or in some in clinical trial that do just that. So when we are damaging the immune system, immune modulation can still be quite depleting. And immune suppression hits the immune system at a very high level, but very efficiently reduces its activity. Okay, before we go to our next chapter, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, you can, yeah, sure, sure. So the question is that if you were to do plasma exchange, that's that technique where we pull antibodies out, we pull blood out, put it through a filter and just put the blood back in. Could you also do IVIG, that is give that patient antibodies from donors? The answer is yes, you could, and yes, that would work. However, you will not get it paid for. So plasma exchange is already a relatively expensive uh, therapy. IVIG, as you can imagine, is there's no way to make human antibodies without asking humans to donate them. And in fact, the amount of antibody that we give a patient comes from many hundreds of donors. So the ratio is hundreds to one each dose. Uh, and so you have to you have to pay those people. 
And so this is plasma donation centers, unfortunately, often in our inner cities. Uh, and so uh, the costs of producing IVIG are high. Costs of doing plasma exchange are also high. Um, and uh, payers just are unlikely to approve both. Thank you for the question, though. Yes. For, for the IVIG infusions at the plasma exchange, is it something that they have to continuously get done to stay ahead of their disease, or is it something yeah. um, when the disease flares up? Uh, no, so the implication Here, here. Oh, yes, sorry, sorry. So the, the question here is um, if uh, plasma exchange or IVIG has to be continuously done or can only be dosed with flares. Um, and so again, thank you for the question. The implication of not managing an illness in my space of nerve or muscle disease is permanent damage to the structures in question. If the structure in question is a nerve that helps you move, then you have lost some percentage of control over a limb, over chewing, over the chest wall and breathing. And so you can imagine how flares would be additive over time. Um, so the, the leaving the immune system in place means that you have to chart the re-expression of those antibodies and you have to intervene periodically. Often for us, it's every three weeks to keep titers low so that those antibodies don't build up to a point where they're damaging in mass. Um, and so a very insightful question. Other thoughts? So um, I have not mentioned steroids. <laughs> steroids, um, work in a number of different ways. Very, very high doses of steroids can be toxic to those T cells, those helpers, regulators. Lower doses might reduce the intensity of local inflammation. Think about the dose of steroids in your skin cream when you get poison ivy. That is not substantial, right? A single digits percentage but relatively effective at reducing local inflammation and dosed over two or three days does the job, right? And so the, the goal there is not to destroy the immune system at the location you're applying the skin cream. It's merely to manage the toxic exposure, right? So steroids kind of fall on both spectrums depending on the, the dose and um, the uh, speed of the infusion. Thank you again for the questions. Nope. Okay. So COVID-19, COVID-19 and immunity. So uh, first off, um, COVID-19 continues to cause mortality. Uh, and if this is a grim talk, because I can't talk about death the whole time, uh, it is kind of the metric I care the most about. Uh, <laughs> keep the patients alive. Um, but every time I talk about mortality, that is a patient who is at risk of dying, I'm talking about many, many more who are at risk of morbidity, that is harm, right? Orders of magnitude more who are harmed in these calculations um, rather than who die. So COVID-19 activates the immune system very, very strongly. And mitigation strategies are really dependent on the immune system, right? Our vaccination strategy requires a robust immune system. So COVID-19 has caused significant mortality. Um, this is data that reports global deaths associated with causes dating to 2020. It's current as of a few days ago. Uh, and you can see COVID-19 as the number three cause of death globally uh, over this time frame. Uh, here you can see data reflecting the United States disease activity. This is from yesterday. 
Uh, and you can see uh, 2,300 um, patients who had passed away in the United States in the previous week due to COVID-19. Um, so listed, I think, first or second in their death certificate is, this how, is how this is tallied. Uh, and a stated case rate of 230 cases um, nationwide, 230,000 rather. Uh, and so um, still, even in a time when we don't recognize or take the measures that we once were, this is a prominent and active disease process. Uh, and it continues to affect the health of our patients. Without a surprise, those most vulnerable are the ones who are taking the brunt of the impact today. And as you can imagine from the topic of the hour, those patients with autoimmune illnesses remain very cautious about their health. Mitigation strategies require a robust immune system. So again, vaccination primes the immune system to create antibodies. And many of our techniques in modulating or suppressing the immune system focus substantially on the antibody life cycle. So uh, IVIG replaces the patient's uh, antibodies. Plasma exchange replaces the patient's antibodies. B cell inhibiting therapies like rituximab, rituximab, rituximab yes, that's the generic word, <laughs> uh, inhibit uh, antibodies. So um, all of these focus on the antibody life cycle for many of our disorders. So previous exposure to COVID-19 leads to antibody production. Plasma cells mature and then they're available. So again, a holy moly slide, very, very complex. We're gonna point out certain things here um, whenever my mouse comes back. So um, this diagram includes T cells and plasma cells, and it includes these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Those are kicked up as part of that complement activation cascade, right? And those pro-inflammatory cytokines then promote additional disease propagation. This is a part of the problem in COVID-19. This picture is depicted in an alveolar sac that is a component of the lung. And the dangerous phase in COVID-19 is the so-called so cytokine storm. That is the inflammatory markers reach a peak, driving inflammation and fluid infiltration into the lungs, right? And so as we think about how COVID-19 activates the immune system, we may start to understand how we might better balance the need to suppress immune system function and the need to weigh that suppression against the disease activity of immune activating things like viral infections. So uh, here we go. Restricting immunity worsens COVID-19 risks uh, so at the top of this slide is non-IS, that is patients who are not immune suppressed, versus IS, that's patients who are immune suppressed. The non-immune suppressed patients are taken as the benchmark for their relative risk of mortality. And you can see substantial increases in risk of mortality in patients who are immune suppressed and get uh, COVID-19. A little bit further down in the table, if patients are immune suppressed because we are actively suppressing their immune system with medications, we in fact have the benefit of a breakdown of which suppression, suppressing strategies they were on and was it modulating or suppressing. Up above, we have other conditions that lead to immune suppression or can be associated with immune suppression, such as malignancies and transplants. Now, what's curious about the data on the bottom highlighted by the arrow is that we would think that damaging the immune system would lead to greater risk of poor outcomes than leaving it intact and tinkering with it. And in fact, this paper suggests that is not true. It would suggest that modulating the immune system remains a poorly understood endeavor. 
And then just plain damaging the immune system is at least more predictable and patients in fact have better outcomes today. This was, it would be a stunning revelation that we are not actually very good at modulating the immune system and that the recommendations we would have made for two years about what we should and shouldn't avoid may have been wrong. To wrinkle the conversation a little bit more, uh, this is a fun fact. Um, post COVID-19 infection, there is an increased risk of developing autoimmunity. Uh, and so the vigorousness with which COVID-19 appears to um, provoke the immune system then opens a window apparently for the immune system to target self. And so all the more reason to have an initial response that results in a short lasting uncomplicated infection because if it is uncomplicated in the obvious ways early on, it's just plain less likely to be uncomplicated in the later ways later down the road. Um, and so when we think about that rock and the hard place, right? You have a, an autoimmune condition, it's damaging very, gen, uh, very um, fragile structures that will die if they are allowed to be damaged. And so you must suppress the immune system in just the right way to is not open risks from infection. This has been the challenge that we have lived in this space over the last two and a half or three years. So COVID-19 continues to cause mortality. COVID-19 activates the immune system strongly. Mitigation strategies require immune system prep. And COVID-19 can lead to dysregulation of the immune system to the extent that patients develop autoimmune diseases after these infections. Before we go on to our last chapter, any thoughts, questions? Okay. So what is a patient to do, right? We have spent like, what, 40 minutes now? painting the grimmest of pictures, right? So what is a patient to do? Um, so patient needs the immune therapy, but there's a significant risk of observed mortality if you treat, uh, or if you don't treat the autoimmune illness and a significant risk of mortality if you treat and COVID-19 occurs. So first again, we're gonna think about suppression versus modulation. Um, what is a patient to do is to initially balance which strategy are they comfortable with. Suppression incurs that broader and longer lasting effect, but modulation might actually be associated with higher risks today based on how we execute it. So one potential avenue is to target very, very finitely. And so one of the most exciting avenues for clinical trial development right now in autoimmunity is CAR T cells. We are unfortunately not yet involved in these trials. I will jump on the opportunity once I have a chance. What is a CAR T cell? A CAR T cell is a cell, so this therapy, is, uh, first off I should say, are currently used in cancer and they are FDA approved. And so I think the translation over to autoimmunity is uh, forthcoming. And in fact, I will show you some data, some very early data on that. So in a CAR T cell, we remove blood from a patient in order to get their T cells. Remember, T cells have three functions. They can help, they can regulate, or they can directly kill. So you remove blood from a patient to get their T cells. Then you genetically modify those T cells so that they express receptors on their outside that specifically bind against a target that you want them to bind to. And in autoimmunity, the target you're binding against is the B cells, the specific B cell lineage that is producing the antibodies that you don't want. And you can tell them because their 
antigen presentation membranes. That is the, the specific thing that those B cells are looking for on their surfaces looks a certain way. So you modify these T cells, you promote their proliferation in the lab, and you give them back to the patient. And in doing so, you attempt to eliminate the B cell line that is causing your problem. So is it available? Does it work? Uh, the answer is yes, this is human data. This is human data in patients with musk uh, CAR T cells. It's a variety of myasthenia. Uh, and what you're looking at here is the percentage lysis in controls versus in patients with the exposed, um, with the uh, mutated CAR T cell. And so lysis percentages go quite, um, are, are quite high and quite efficient for this approach. Albeit this is three patients. How else could you attempt to hijack the immune system to turn down its ferocity without necessarily eliminating its effectiveness? We talked in, about the cytokine storm. So if you hijack the interleukins or you eliminate the complement cascade at certain places, then you will eliminate local inflammation that is triggered by the immune system. We talked about how there were four fun or five functions of an antibody. If you can eliminate one or two, but leave the others intact, then you can, in a more precise way, eliminate the threat to the patient or reduce it. Uh, these are available. Both interleukin inhibitors are on the market now for diseases not within my space. Complement inhibitors are on the market in my space. And in fact, we have been very privileged to be a part of those clinical trials. And these are some of the drugs we have helped take to market with that data. And so precision of understanding helps us try to, under, to try to navigate this very tricky path. And again, this is the complement cascade triggered by those antibodies. And the current inhibitors of complement, they act here at C5. Um, so they're quite downstream. They allow for some effects of a cascade, but not the final effects. This again is that diagram of the cytokines of uh, immuno, immune responses in COVID with this central region right here being pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so if you can eliminate those pro-inflammatory cytokines, you can leave the bulk of the immune response intact without necessarily the uh, level of damage that in COVID is end stage or most directly contributes to mortality. So what is a patient to do for now? Avoid COVID. Um, but in the future, it's innovate to target interventions that narrow the field of effect. And this is a wide open field. And the need for 10 million people in the United States today who are having this conversation is vast. Many of those patients with diseases such as eczema or psoriasis or vitiligo, simply choose to go untreated. And that's not right. With that, thank you. questions. So if you want to take questions, I can look if we get any online. Sure. By all means, any uh, thoughts, questions, tomatoes? Tomatoes go to him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk just not the not thing, but I have a major question really quick. Uh, related to the CAR T cell yeah. uh, strategy that you're describing, 
Uh, my question parallels what Max asked earlier yeah. about affordability and scalability. Right. Uh, specifically, I'm curious, do you have to, are you for these? Is the idea that you would only have to harvest once and genetically modify and then essentially keep a bank? Are they a self-propagating cell line or is this going to be similar to, let's say, rituximab where you have to dose, I think it's every six months, uh, repeated dosing and repeated harvesting? So can you try to repeat that? Yeah, yeah, that's a lot sure. of too. Sure. So the, the question yes. with CAR T cell approaches is would you need repeat dosing? Or could you knock a patient into remission with just one cycle? So uh, we can learn a little bit here from rituximab. Rituximab eliminates plasma cell lines, but it does so indiscriminately. And what we know is that. Rituximab is amongst one of the best approaches that we have for inducing remission in a patient. Once you eliminate the plasma cell lines, they will regrow, but not necessarily colonially expand. Um, so it's unlikely that you're going to permanently eliminate the disease. But if you have fewer um, clones, you have lower titers of antibody production and less meaningful disease expression. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. A lot of these autoimmune disorders, even diagnosed, and I know it's sort of a specialty at L that is often overlooked. It's not something that is necessarily traumatic initially or very visual, oftentimes. So the question is. How are these disorders even diagnosed? Uh, and I, I, again, we're talking, I think, about disorders of nerve, muscle, or the junction in between. Um, it really comes down to patients eventually fail. They fail in their gait and they start to fall. They fail in their sensation and they go numb. They fail in their power and they go weak. They drop cups from their hands. They um, are unable to do their physical jobs. Uh, ultimately, neurology is very difficult because we have so many patients with subtle features. And if we can't prove a subtle feature, we tend to say, well, please come back to me. By the time they are failing, they have suffered permanent organ damage. And so your window to act is very narrow at that point because they are actively permanently losing function. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of times the patient must fail before they're diagnosed. And that's um, a specialty where imaging is not particularly useful. That's correct. So the que the follow up question is: Is imaging useful or or no in this scenario? And, and your assumption is correct. When we image the nervous system, we think about brain and spinal cord. Um, in the periphery, we can do MRIs of the muscle and sometimes see fat stranding or edema. But honestly, the MRI is not particularly good at this. And with the nerve, we can do ultrasound, but that's really best used over a very focal area. For example, in carpal tunnel syndrome, when you're trying to see whether or not the median nerve is being pushed on at the wrist. Uh, nerves swell, just like all organs swell when they're damaged. And so with ultrasound, you might see 10 millimeters of cross-sectional area, 10, 14, 10. Well, now you know where the injury is and the magnitude of injury. Ultrasound is very useful. In these disseminated diseases, though, there is no focal injury. So imaging tends to be not as productive. Other thoughts, questions, anything online? Then, yeah. Hi. I'm sorry. I've Please. got another question for you. Um, would you mind speaking about within your team, some of, uh, presumably your whole team are not all MDs or DOs, um, could you talk a little bit for those of us that are still considering career options, Sure. what specialties or what 
training some of your team have? Yeah, so um, we we do have our share of physicians, um, many of them very highly subspecialized. Um, but perhaps more important for a patient, um, especially it, for the long term of their journey, are our physical therapists, uh, occupational therapists. Once I have figured out what is injuring a patient and how to control it, they have to recover. And these patients have suffered permanent injury uh, and they need to rehabilitate. So the PTs and the OTs are very important. The orthotics people, that's the people who put braces on to avoid contractures of muscle, which can be painful and non-functional at the same time. Imagine that, right? My nerves are healing. This crazy guy who's losing his hair has figured it out. And now I'm left with a clawed hand and it hurts. And that wasn't supposed to be the outcome I was supposed to heal, right? So those braces force the hand open, allow the stretching of the tendons, and then the PTs work that strength back, right? Very, very important roles. They, these people give meaning to the patient's recovery. Our research associates, um, our research associates are largely bachelor's degree trained, um, and they have the very difficult job of managing to fit into my schedule. Uh, they are very detail-oriented people because if you're following a research protocol, everything has to be as it was written in the protocol. Uh, and down to the order at which you draw the labs and the order in which you do the assessments. Absolutely invaluable. None of the data would be acquired without them. Thank you for your question. Any other questions in the room? <clears throat> All right, I guess with that, let's uh, thank you. Thank Dr. Sashdev for his presentation. I'll get a bit close in a second. Sure. And I, I just want to thank uh, Alma College and Dr. Turk and the other faculty and staff uh, for helping uh, put together this uh, great evening. And uh, we look forward to coming back next year. Thanks. Thank you.